Nigel, we are very happy to have you here in Mexico. Hi, nice. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we are listening. You made the first dual robot robotic uh, operation in the world. Can you tell us about this? So it's been uh, it's been an ongoing process and try to improve surgery for especially spine surgery for people. It's such delicate surgery where you got to be very very accurate. If you're not completely accurate, then uh, if you're not completely accurate, patients can be paralyzed. So we know that in human in in people's hands, we're only about 85 to 90 percent. Uh, accurate and we also know from the aviation world that most of the accidents that happen are due to human error so we're only so good in what we're doing but we're very good at planning and doing stuff so we've been using for the last several years one robot and this robot allows us to use pre-operative imaging and turn it into the surgery when we're performing the surgery converting it into a real surgery here we decided that it's not accurate enough. In cases in which we have bad trauma, where the pieces of bone are always constantly moving, any movement of bone can cause paralysis. So we need real-time, accurate imaging of the patients. So for that, we took a second robot, which wasn't designed at all for spine surgery, and we converted him into a spine robot, and we got real-time imaging. Now this robot gives us the imaging, and this one it helps us get to where we need to go. So we have to get them both to talk. One robot is an Israeli the, in, robot called Mazor. The other one is a German robot from Simmons company called Azigo. And we had to get the both languages of the robots to talk to each other, to get the diacom, the data, to be accurate enough to allow us to perform the surgery at a level of accuracy of 0 0.5 millimeters. That's the level of accuracy in which we work, which is fantastic. And then once we got it transformed and we got them to talk to each other, we were able to perform surgery at a level of accuracy of close to 100%. So the risk of patients of getting any neural damage has dropped almost to none due to these, uh, this, to this technological advancement which we performed. How did you think about that? I think many of our, most of the things in our world are already out there. The, the, most, the most important thing is how to put the things together. People think in a small box and they invent something for one use. And they don't understand that it can be used much better for another use, or not, maybe not much better, as good for another use. So our job is to, to look around and see what's out there and put the stuff together. And once I saw that this robot exists and it wasn't accurate for, and we knew we had a problem with spine surgery, and we knew that this imaging robot is out there but it's not designed for spine surgery, so I was able to bring the teams together to say, guys, we got to solve this problem. So everyone said, no, no, it can't be done. And then once we got them to really settle down and get the languages to talk to each other, the computer languages, is we were able to solve the problem and have the two robots work together to help our patients. And why do you think it is Israel that, that invents this and not another country? We're the startup nation. Israel is a startup nation. We are, uh, the Jewish people have been for many years involved in inventing things. Our heritage is to think and create new issues, uh, to solve problems. So when we come to a problem which we need to make better, our job is to go out and solve it. So it's good to be thinking only about today's solution, but part of our work, and I think part of our education in Hadassah as a hospital, is to go out of our comfort zone and to think how we can solve tomorrow's problem. Not only do today's medicine good, but the, the DNA, our instructions, our way of thinking is how to make tomorrow's medicine better for, our, for us, for our patients, and for our future patients to be. And now uh, they tell me you have been to Ethiopia, leading a group of uh, rescue, uh, rescue doctors. Can you tell us a little bit about this? So we were, uh, it's, we were uh, last year we went to Ethiopia. Northern Ethiopia is an area of about 20 million people, and they do not have a spine surgeon there. And children who are born and developing with horrendous spine deformities have no one to take care of them. And these kids live and then they die because of the complications of such a situation. So about a year, Hadassah uh, Hospital has been working in Ethiopia for many years. They've been working with the HIV projects and helping children with uh, their orphans to take care of themselves, helping with the entire infectious disease situation over there. So I, I, I had one of the doctors was training by in Hadassah that, and I had a conversation with him, who does your spine surgery over there? He said, we don't have anyone. So I said, well, we got to solve that problem. 
So the hospital in Ethiopia, you can imagine, doesn't look like a good modern hospital. It's like a room of four walls. So everyone was telling us, look, you can't do it. It cannot be done. It's not, you know, it's not even a military hospital. None of this can happen. We said, and I said, you know, we really got to make it happen. So we committed a group of surgeons and anesthesiologists and physical therapists, and uh, we got them all to, to commit to the trip. And then we went down on a trip to Ethiopia. We chose patients. Out of hundreds of patients, we, we chose the patients that we think it's safe and able to do. And we put it together. We used the Israeli Foreign Affairs Office to help us transfer the equipment. Hadassah Hospital donated our time and all of the supplies for the surgery. And then we went down to Ethiopia. We, we, we did a whole week of tremendous surgeries, five, six, seven, eight hour surgeries. Thank God the patients are great. And we're planning a future mission there as well. But the truth of it is that <coughs> when there's a will, there's a way. And that is a, and you know, if we decide that we need to, if it's something that's close to our heart, then if we put our efforts to it and we get the people involved and mobilized towards that project, we will make it happen. Uh, going back to the dual surgery, I, I heard that it was done on a Palestinian. Uh, what, what did you feel when uh, you are operating on a Palestinian? Uh, is it different? Is it the same? I operate on, uh, I operate on Palestinian patients every week. I operate on uh, patients I have. I'm one of the referral centers. Hadassah as a hospital is one of the referral centers for the tough cases in which the Palestinians cannot take it. Last, this week, we had the conflict in Gaza. I operated on Sunday on a, pal on a girl from Gaza that was transferred for us after she was paralyzed by a surgeon in Gaza to help us, you know, kind of to despair. So we operate, we're constant. It is patients are patients. On the inside, everyone is the same. We don't care about their religion. We don't care about... Their, their, their upbringing. When they have a problem, our commitment as doctors, as surgeons, as people, is to give them the best solution that we can. And uh, you are one of the first uh, referral hospitals when it, when it comes to uh, attacks, to, uh, uh, to uh, terrorists, suicide, etc. What, what are the things you have seen until now? We're, uh, Hadassah is the uh, only level one trauma center in Jerusalem. It is uh, the leading, probably one of the 20 or 30 leading trauma centers in the world today. And we, I mean, we constantly get trauma victims. Uh, I've seen anything you can imagine. I've seen people with shrapnel through every part of their body. I've seen people that were burnt, uh, lung injuries. I had fr friends of mine that I've been taking care of after they were injured. So it's part of our life. We do. You know, we see, uh, even when we were students in medical school, we went through training and how to deal with that stuff. And it is part of our, it is part of our work. And we, once the hospital is so set up to, uh, to dealing with these tough cases, is that there's specific protocols and how we work. We wrote the protocols that the entire country is afterwards assembling when they have a multiple injury. I gave a lecture on it to the Czech uh, spine, repo uh, sp spine organization on it. we always thinking in how to improve and survive patients' care. But you can, uh, we've seen everything, you know, it's uh, from light injuries to gunshot wounds to difficult injuries. Um, and sadly also the patients that we weren't able to save. So we've seen everything. Can you tell us about an important moment of your work when you thought this is worth it? Uh, one of the best examples I can give is a case of uh, I was sitting in a restaurant with a friend that came specially from America to meet me and uh, he was in for two days and we said you know what let's meet up in a restaurant I haven't seen him we're catching up after a long time and as we're sitting down and ordering the meal I get a phone call from my resident in the hospital said there's a terrible car accident there's a girl that's th that had her spine broken in two places she's barely moving one leg I said I, I called my friend and I apologize they said you know we ordered the food keep the food, I'm running. I was speeding to the hospital at about maybe 150 kilometers per hour. And I, we arrived in the hospital just before putting her to sleep for surgery. She was still moving one finger. That's all she had left. Took her to surgery, reduced the fracture, assisted her. And now the best thing out of it is that now uh, she's up and walking. And the nicest thing that I was uh, invited to her wedding not too long ago. And it was uh, a really emotional state, you know, you see that for a girl who on one side could have been in a wheelchair for the rest of her life and now she's up and dancing in her most uh, happiest day of her life. That was uh, one of those moments you cannot forget. Uh, 
After the Ciudad de las Ideas, what is your message to humanity? I think uh, my message to humanity is think out of the box. You can help people, even by small things. You don't need to do the biggest thing in the world or the smallest thing in the world. We've seen here over the last few days great lectures from people doing small things to big things. You don't need to... There's a statement, Lo alecha melacha ligmor. You're not, it's not your job to finish the, everything, but you cannot say, oh, it's too big for me, someone else will do it. Each one of us can contribute in whatever he can, and that will uh, make humanity a better place. Uh, did your Judaism inspire you to do what you do and to become what you are? Yes, I mean, I think uh, Judaism... Because I see you like the Bible. <laughs> Judaism inspires you. It is, uh, it's part of our heritage, it's part of our life. I mean, it definitely gives you a warm spot inside. And I, I mean, there's someone asked me in the past, you know, uh, do surgeons believe in God? So I think, you know, everyone down inside has his own God inside to help him in a difficult moment when he's struggling. And I think that's definitely, you're hoping that in your operating room, he's overseeing you and hope, making sure that your outcomes of your patients are good. Do you do a prayer before? No, I do not pray before my surgeries. But deep down inside, you know, there's an old statement that in a foxhole, there's no atheist. When a person is in fighting, everyone's hoping to get the best outcome. So I think everyone down inside. But it's funny to see. About, so we have. Uh, so we're going into surgery, and we have uh, anesthesiologist who is Christian, who's training maybe for Mexico because we have also 31 doctors from Mexico at the hospital, and you have uh, a nurse who is uh, a Muslim. And he says, and you have Jewish doctors, religious and non-religious, in all levels of observancy. And then you see everyone concealing to his own, you know, place or God. Or, and everyone brings it to surgery for the best outcomes. You can say the Arab guy saying, you know, la ila or bismillah. And then, you know, you say, yala or bezrat Hashem, you know, God's help. And so it's really a, a fantastic place to be in. Thank you very much.